Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at AWE. Uh, how many uh, of you are familiar with Otoy? Show of hands. Good amount, good amount. Uh, well, for those that aren't familiar with Otoy, we are a graphics company. Um, we've been working on rendering um, and, uh, and also interactive uh, holographic experiences, content, and tool chains for a while. And I figured that I would start off by describing our vision for the future and where we see things going. I've been doing this, uh, these kinds of presentations for a while. I think um, when I started talking about the 2020s, it was five years back, and now we're about a year and a half away. But the future for media, whether it's in mixed reality or whether it's traditional linear content you see on TV, is evolving rapidly. And so I think as we get into the next decade, you're going to see these kinds of trends emerge, where photorealism, photo um, in other words, making CG content look perfectly real, is going to become not only cheap and fast, but built in, a commodity, something that every single game, if it needs to, will look as real as the best Hollywood visual effects that you can put into a film. Furthermore, even linear content like films are going to be built in game engines. They'll be in real time. You're seeing those trends emerge where we have uh, big filmmakers uh, like Neil Blomkamp that are doing entire shorts all in the Unity engine. And furthermore, the tools that we use to experience, create, and work with uh, content and media are going to be intuitive. We don't really imagine that there's going to be a system with siloed apps or even the web as we know it. We think there's going to be a lot of spatial, interchangeable content and, uh, and services that will link together. And that truly is how we see the metaverse emerging. The tools that are used to create that content will be things like Tiltbrush or Oculus Medium, things that are actually inside of VR and XR that allow you to spatially experience the content that you want others to share. And as we get towards 10 years out, uh, that's really where the work that we're doing now is, um, is, is focused on as far as building these you know, foundational pieces. Because in about 10 years, I think that holographic displays, in other words, uh, displays that are so dense, they have trillions of uh, megapixels, that can actually beam out images and visuals that are equivalent to what you have in the Star Trek holodeck. Uh, they'll include things like touch through ultra hap haptics. They'll also be everywhere. They'll be cheap. Uh, the one thing that we've seen is that televisions, display screens all become much more inexpensive over time, and the more of them that there are, the cheaper they become. So holographic services that can capture and display uh, holographic content can be on clothing, they can be on walls, windows, and that's a game changer. But the road there is actually very, uh, very precarious. There's a lot of uh, compute power needed to power these devices. And you know, we're trying really hard uh, at Otoy to come up with ways where we can come up with network effects, uh, codec streaming tools, all these things that enable this future to happen. And so our mission is to democratize this holographic pipeline, especially on the content creation side. And in particular, our focus has been on solving the hard problems with holographic capture, uh, holographic rendering, uh, and, uh, and finally streaming and media. And so this presentation is really sort of a exploration of those pieces and also how they relate to the overarching service that we're building on top of the Ethereum blockchain called Render, which is, in our view, fundamentally necessary for powering um, a holographic pipeline like the ones that we're imagining in, uh, in the next few years. So focusing on the middle segment, rendering, uh, typically rendering for films at the highest end has been a pretty laborious process. Back when I was working uh, initially on visual effects on Transformers, uh, ILM would render one frame in 40 hours. And we created a tool uh, called Octane Render. The initial work that I was doing around GPU rendering enabled me to speed up that process for films. But we're now 10 years into Octane Render's lifecycle. It's a uh, program for Windows and Linux and Mac. And we've had about four releases so far uh, every two years. And we've been able to speed up the rendering process. And we've actually been simulating the laws of physics and light to get us um, nearly real-time images, animations. You know, Finally, a few years ago, we were able to really get cinematic visual effects to be rendered on the GPU at a fraction of the time. And this year, we're, we're focused on bringing Octane to real-time game engines like Unity. And the future is holographic. So for those that haven't seen Octane, um, well, here's an example. This is the opening of Westworld. It's rendered. Uh, in Octane for Cinema 4D on, uh, on NVIDIA GPUs. And a lot of TV shows, a lot of uh, beautiful works have been done on Octane. This is The Crown uh, from Netflix. And what's great about Octane for television is that under those time constraints and budgets, um, you can use Octane to deliver 
these frames in a fraction of the time that it used to take on CPUs. And the quality is just awesome. I mean, there is a lot of shortcuts even in films that are done in CGI, and Octane doesn't take any of them. It actually simulates the laws of physics, super intuitive for artists. And to that end, we felt the future of Octane wasn't to, to, you know, for the ILMs or the high-end visual studios. We wanted to put this in millions of users' hands, make it like Photoshop. And so we partnered uh, with Unity uh, about two years ago. And as of last year, uh, Octane, that render that you saw, is able to be used for free inside of Unity. So it's been embedded um, since Unity 2017.1. You can actually load in files and assets that are generated from all of the other tools that Octane connects to, Max and Maya and Cinema 4D. And millions of Unity users now have these capabilities. They can be um, filmmakers if they want. And they can use the tools and workflow in Unity that they're already familiar with. But we want to take all of that work and think about how this applies to interactive content or even mixed reality content. And so things that are beyond traditional uh, you know, light field baking or light, sorry, light map baking uh, involve creating holographic textures and assets. So this is an example of what you can do in Octane for Unity with traditional light mapping. It still looks beautiful. Uh, you can take uh, scenes from uh, our cinematic pipeline, bring them into Unity Editor. It'll build the lighting for you. And you can treat these as, um, as very high-end game objects, and they require a high-end PC to play back. Uh, but you still get interactive um, experiences that are generated by the same cinematic pipeline you have in, uh, in Octane's film pipeline. Going forward, um, one thing that we've added to Unity this year with the release of Octane 4 is a, the ability to do things in real time. And that was something that's very tricky. The, uh, the, the workflow and the quality you see uh, previously in Octane has been um, for cinematic setups. But with Brigade, we're able to actually give you noise-free, ray-traced lighting and reflections. Um, it's going to become even easier to do that with advances like NVIDIA's RTX, which is powering the DirectX ray tracing announced a few months ago. And really, the only thing that's kind of holding back the quality of, of de deploying this is the noise. There's a little bit of flicker and noise that you get when you're rendering uh, in real time with path tracing. And that's also why we've been focused on other approaches like AI denoising. Uh, that enable us to get this uh, to be nearly instantaneous, with the idea that you can publish a game in Unity, put it on uh, our blockchain network, the assets get pulled in, and you can ray trace the entire game experience, share that with other people. Um, Denoising is a really important part of making that work and getting to that level of quality. So AI is a, is a fairly new um, approach for denoising. It's uh, something that NVIDIA and ourselves have been experimenting with uh, practically for the last year. But the results are absolutely amazing. On a, uh, you know, on, a, on a single GPU, we can now render 1080p in one second at perfect quality. And with advances in ray tracing hardware and tensor core uh, hardware, we can actually get this to be 30 to 40 frames a second, eventually 60. And you can then add more GPU power, stream it from the cloud. So we have all the tools necessary to really deliver holographic reality um, you know, at an affordable cost. And when I mean holographic content in reality, I'm actually talking about the equivalent of a white light hologram. So what you're seeing here is an actual holographic stream uh, that would be sent to a holographic display panel. And inside of, you know, we can simulate that inside of a VR environment where you can look at, around the panel from different viewpoints, and it always looks perfect. But it really is just one giant holographic texture. And if you were to think about the analogy to the Star Trek holodeck, we can take six of those surfaces and put them in a cube, and you can step into that cube. And you'll have a perfect uh, six degrees of freedom experience where you're inside of a holographic holographically rendered environment, and then you can mix that with real-time ray-traced uh, graphics as well that are powered by game engines like Unity. So the, um, the ultimate goal of, a, of, a, of having a metaverse where you can you know, mistake that for reality is that we can render enough of these cubes or we can do these, in real th these things in real time, and we can then connect that to holographic display surfaces. And in the interim, we have things like phone-based AR, we have goggles. Those things are interim steps towards experiencing this kind of holographic content um, until we get to the point where holographic Panels are cheap and inexpensive. So the entire network of capture and rendering and streaming and publishing in particular is something that we've built on top of Render. And Render is um, a, a cloud service. Initially, it was centralized. It is now based on Ethereum. And we have multiple phases, which I'll get into, that are enabling uh, all these GPU miners out there to participate and render these holographic experiences, whether they're live or pre-computed. Um, we've also partnered with a number of really interesting companies, including Facebook. So with Facebook, they announced last year at F8 a um, a holographic camera uh, based on um, 24 lenses. And we're providing a pipeline for that through um 
through the render network that connects to all these different tools. So you can take your uh, Facebook 360 um, and volumetric videos, bring them into uh, Octane and, and the render network, and edit them in tools like Unity and After Effects, publish them. This is sort of the uh, roadmap of what we're deploying. Um, and you know, this is also something that has brought in a lot of other interesting partners as well. So RED, uh, if you're familiar with the RED camera, they're now supplying the hardware and creating the cameras for Facebook. And we're in the middle of that ecosystem, processing these jobs on the cloud, delivering these streams. And it's very exciting stuff. So on the capture side, you have an object. You bring it into this system. And you can then, on the right you're seeing, just stream that to a phone as a, as a light field or a holographic asset. You can edit these holographic pieces in Unity. And the streams themselves, which are only about 1.5 megabits for phones, can be full replacements for having all this rendering power local. It basically gives you a holographic viewport um, over over the wires, basically. And this is a, a test we did on the Tango phone streaming that holographic asset that was scanned in and captured uh, directly to a device. And it's pretty cool. When you have multiple holographic assets in mixed reality, uh, you can mix those together very inexpensively, very cheaply. And this is an example where I'm taking two holographic cubes, uh, the room size, actually the room scale, and I'm bringing them together. And the cost of, of blending these, th these pieces, because most of the work is already rendered in that holographic asset, is very inexpensive. So for mixed reality to really leverage this work, and for us, obviously, things like the iPhone are a huge market. We want to get AR working really well on the phones. Um, we also need to know what the environment's doing. And so we have capture capabilities um, in our client that we've been developing that allow you to take the depth from the uh, rear view cameras on the iPhone. And we can use that to generate, uh, this is actually running at 120 hertz. This is a, uh, um, environment from our office. This is actually then stored on the phone, and we have a representation of the scene that we can update and mix objects uh, inside of as they're um, brought in or streamed. And relighting is very important as well. It's not just good enough to have a holographic asset that looks real from all these viewpoints. We need to have that mix and match exactly what you're seeing in the real world live. And so this is actually running on an iPhone. And you can see you know, reflections are picked up, lighting works. And as we sort of head beyond even the phones, we're looking at testing things like having face tracking um, and auto stereoscopic displays. So there's a light field on that display that I can actually look at from uh, any angle without any glasses. And if the display is moved, it has a tracker on it. It'll actually reproject that holographic stream correctly. And glasses free is really important. Phone free is really important. That's one of the things that we're we think are going to make this, um, you know, the entire mixed reality ecosystem really, really, really mainstream. When you have to wear nothing and things are ambiently projected from holographic surfaces, it's pretty awesome. Uh, again, AI is something that we're using as well to be able to take chunks of holographic data and expand those to room size without having to send down more data or render more. Um, there's a lot of value in that. We're able to then extend uh, explorable volumes to, to much larger sizes. And especially as we get towards um, you know, the, these large room scale installations, um, we need to have every possible savings of bandwidth and compute that we can come up with. So to that end, we've, we've built a cloud service that already handles rendering these light fills, these holographic streams, and Amazon's a partner on, uh, you know, on our network, but we actually run out of GPUs all the time on the public cloud. So Render was introduced last year as a um, Ethereum-backed token system that allows us to take the same exact GPU jobs that customers actually pay for on, uh, on Amazon and then send that out to uh, anyone with a GPU that's on the network. And what we found was that we're paying about, if we just take the cost of, of rendering on Amazon to a, to a GPU miner with a 1080 you know, mining Ethereum, the payout for render is, is 10x, 50x over what the Ethereum payout is. And it also is an awesome system because there's no hashing numbers. It just uses the blockchain and it uses all that compute power to actually fulfill work that users and content creators need. And ultimately, these first three phases, of which we're now about to enter phase two, are all about just replacing and decentralizing what we've built commercially for years um, on the centralized cloud. And as we go beyond that in phase four, uh, which is going to start next year, we want to enable all of the content and work that's been created and published um, to also have IP rights so that you can have remixing rights. You can decide how two holographic assets can be mixed together. You can publish services and layers that can actually you know, be pulled in and based on the very same economy that's used to render these, uh, these assets in the first place. Um, so we have a render SDK. We're building that out. It'll work across. Um, 
all these different platforms, including iOS. Our tools are already integrated in Unity, and, um, and we're also doing an Unreal integration. But we think that all of these pieces, and the blockchain in particular, both for IP rights, both for being able to sort of leverage computing and publishing, critically important. Uh, and open metaverse is important, frankly. I mean, there's no real you know, path to success if we don't have some sort of interoperability between assets, high quality assets. So we were invited by Cable Labs to join MPEG um, and Simpty, and we're providing uh, all of the um, data, the specifications for, the, um, for all the holographic scene and content pipeline stuff you've been seeing to these um, open source initiatives and we want to make that royalty free. I think the industry needs that, and that works progressing pretty well. Um, and then I think that the end result of all of this work is to come up with a way where life just feels magical, where you can just mix and match things from different worlds, different pieces, and have that experience just be absolutely beautiful and perfect. And we have some great advisors uh, for Render. We have JJ Abrams, longtime Octane user, um, you know, has really sort of shared my vision for de democratizing um, this kind of compute and rendering power and also looking at new types of narratives and initiatives that are, um, you know, that are more uh, you know, flexible. And I think that having somebody like that on board has been a fantastic boon to, to this effort. So we have a couple of minutes for questions, um, and I'm sure there are probably a, a number, but thank you so much for your time, and I'd love to sort of dive deeper into anyone's uh, thoughts or questions on what we just presented. Thank you. Yes, in the front. Sorry, I may I may need to. Is there a microphone that we can get to for, for the questions? Okay. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, what is your opinion on, on voxel processing and non traditional rendering techniques that may take advantage of the newer hardware or custom hardware? Have you looked at that at all? Well, when you say voxels, are you talking about just having, you know, basically point cloud data sets versus triangle meshes or triangle soups or sign distance fields or procedurally? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. But yeah. 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 No, I think that's a great question. And the, 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 just to sort of put this in, in context, a lot of the stuff we're showing with these holographic cubes, I mean, they're, they're not point clouds, but they're the equivalent of that. There's no geometry. There's no cost and complexity. And point, you know, there's just more data. And so point clouds, they just store and voxels store all these points rather than having scene complexity embedded in there. And I think that there's some sort of middle ground where you actually have some you know, ability to turn, let's say, a holographic render into voxels, into, into you know, remesh or retopologize it. But ultimately, those problems get solved with ray tracing. And now that ray tracing is basically mainstream and you have hardware that's you know, helping to accelerate that a little bit with, with RTX and DXR, um, it's, it's certainly interesting. Now, I think the, the future is probably not going to be triangle-based. I mean, if you can create uh, you know, continuous services that are procedural, that's what I was asking about, sign distance fields. Um, if you're capturing things, they're not, you're not capturing triangles, you're really just capturing surface data. So I think that, that some sort of hybrid um, you know, surface-based procedural system that can in include voxels and include point clouds, very important. And I don't think we're going to be stuck with polygons and triangles for very long in the next, you know, going into the next three years. Question in the back? Okay. We do support Blender, and uh, we, inside of Blender, you even have the ability to launch all of these rendered jobs currently on Amazon, soon on all these decentralized nodes, so it could be perfect for what you're looking for.